Hello, uh, and welcome to day four of Reflect, Grow, Thrive, a webinar series hosted by YWCA in celebration of International Day of the Girl. I'd first like to start off with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, of the various lands that we're meeting on today. I'm joining from Ghana land and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to welcome you all to share the lands on which you're joining from in the Q&A chat function. So I'd just like to introduce um, our speakers for this session, which is gender equality in the workplace, knowing your rights at work. I'm speaking with Professor Ray Cooper Ayo. She's a professor of gender work and employment relations at the University of Sydney Business School, where she's a co-director of the Women, Work and Leadership Research Group. My name is Shaylee Leach. I'm on the YWCA Young Women's Council, um, but I also wear a few other hats that relate to this topic. Um, I work at the Working Women's Centre SA, a not-for-profit that helps vulnerable workers with work-related issues. Um, and I also have lived experience working in precarious roles for about 10 years, which is like a fancy way of saying I've had a lot of casual jobs. So I just want to start off with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so the way that the webinar works is that Ray will be doing a short presentation on the top, at the top. We'll have a chat a bit more about the themes and then we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end. Um, if you have any um, questions, you can pop them in the Q&A. And, and um, I also just want to let uh, our listeners, people tuning in, know that um, we will be talking about some sensitive issues today. And so if, you know, it gets too much, if it's a bit on the nose, then please, you know, tune out, go get a cup of tea, take care of yourself. Um, we will be recording the session today and you'll be able to access it in about two weeks time um, where there'll also be a survey that we'll be asking you to fill out so you can let us know how we've gone. But for now, um, I'll hand the reins over to Ray. We can get this started. Thanks, Shay. I like, uh, I like that we rhyme today and uh, <laughs> I've been calling this the Ray and Shay show or the Shay and Ray show. So uh, let's start the, the Ray bit. How does that sound? Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi everyone, um, it's really nice to join you here. I'm, um, I'm right, see that picture there? I'm, I'm not very far from that on Gadigal land um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present um, and emerging and also pay respects to elders wherever you are. Um, it's lovely to be asked to come and speak about young women at work because I'm very fast not being in that category. So, um, but I do do quite a bit of research on young women um, at work with, um, with a pretty large research team um, here at the University of Sydney and um, the project that I'm going to talk about uh, first uh, as Shay said I'm going to start out by talking about a bit of research data that we've collected at the University of Sydney with my colleagues from the Women Work and Leadership Research Group um, and that's a, a, a project called the Australian Women's Working Futures um, Project and it really is trying to inject something into the conversation about the world of work that isn't often there. Um, and that is the views of young women. Um, so this project really draws on data uh, from a national survey of young women um, aged 16 to 40. Um, so for many of you watching, maybe um, in the 30s is not young, but for me it is. Um, and uh, we've also done many, many focus groups with different occupational groups and different identity groups um, as well to try to flesh out what the survey data means. Something that's um, kind of interesting that we, oh, we have to start our poll, Shaley. <laughs> we forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm um, going to hand back in the range. Shay show is now going to go back to Shay. <laughs> uh, um, so at the top, uh, we'd just like to ask you all, so thinking about women and work, if you think that women are treated better than men, the same, or worse. So if you could use the um, the poll function and say what you think. I'm kind of curious to see uh, how you will feel about the topic. I'm sure we'll get the results in a bit, but um, we'll keep an eye on that as um, Ray keeps talking us through uh, her research. You want me to keep going? Yeah, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so 
so we've collected data um, both from young women but also from uh, young men of the same age and really our samples look like the label. So what that allows us to do is both to understand what young women uh, think about the world of work and what they want from their future careers but also to compare that to what, um, what young men uh, want. Uh, from work and what they hope and dream for in their future careers. And it won't surprise you to know that they look a little bit different. So I'm just gonna wait for that poll to go away because I don't think I can actually do my data slide with, without it. Thank you. Um, so, um, oh, and here's the result. And the result is that uh, 21 <laughs> of you think that we're uh, treated worse than men. <laughs> <laughs> That's the correct answer. <laughs> Okay, and are we going to go to the other question first, Touche, or are we just are we going to do that later? I think there's another poll question. Yeah, I'm kind of curious to see um, what people think are the biggest issues for women at work. So, what are the biggest challenges that are facing women at work? Is it low pay and pay inequality, job insecurity, disrespect from peers and managers, a lack of access to high quality? flexibility or you can't choose because all of the above or if you think it's something else and if you think it's something else please pop it in the Q&A um, section. I personally think that there are a lot of issues and so it's really hard to choose but I'd love to know what um, you think are the big issues. And while, well, maybe while people fill, fill that out Shay, I could say that we this is essentially one of the questions that we asked um, in our national survey. And we also asked another one, which was about what are the things that matter to you most in the future? And I, that's really what I'm going to be talking about. Well, I'm here until that goes away. Why don't I do a little plug for the YWCA uh, and also for the Working Women's, Women's Centre nationally, because I know that they exist in most states and they do wonderful work. And I know, for example, Shay, that you're associated with the South Australian Working Women's Centre, as well as YWCA. So, and there's our responses. So uh, the, the uh, answer they got 61% is I can't choose all of the above. Um, I would agree and I also agree with um, the other challenges. Um, we've got someone saying that sexual harassment is a massive challenge yeah. at work. Mm, yeah. um, and shortly behind I can't choose is disrespect. And I feel like respect is a pretty central theme. Yeah, but we'll see how it compares. Yeah, right. And so let's come back to that when we get uh, a little bit further into looking at um, our data that we've collected at the university. Okay, so are you ready for me to go, Shay? I'm ready. Good, let's let's go. Shay and Rachel. Oh, if my slides move, wait a minute. Oh no. Oh. I think it's slight wardrobe malfunction. No. I'm gonna stop share and I'm gonna start again. This is really not the day for us technology-wise, is it, Shay? It's all happening, but, you know, I think it's an important topic and <laughs> we're all going to keep keep it together. I think it's really interesting um, how the results of that poll came out in comparison to your survey, and that's me knowing what's coming ahead, because I think um, even within a smaller sample group, you know, we've got, I think, quite compelling evidence there. We do, and we also have slides that move now, so that's good, thank you for feeling. You've got a career in TV. Um, <laughs> okay, so what we're going to talk about today, Shay, is about um, the results of our research, but also some other national research that I'll draw on briefly. Don't worry, it's not going to be like a lecture. What I'm going to do is talk about the, um, the data that we have around these three themes. So it really is about what do young women want in their future careers. Uh, so what do they value the most in terms of where they're heading and, and what that means in their working life? We're gonna talk about what women get. So what is that's what they want, but what are they currently experiencing? And then because there's quite a few gaps between what women want and what women get, we'll talk a bit about what we might do about it. So just to warn people ahead of time, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through the data and then when, you're, when I'm talking, if you've got any questions that you wanted to pop in the Q&A, we can start that as part of the questions that we have when Shay and I have a chat um, and then what we do about it, that's going to be me and Shay together because I think she's got um, a lot of experience there that's really important um, to share in this um, forum. And as Shay's already said, 
bit of a warning. Um, a lot of my material when I talk about working conditions for women um, can be at the very best a bit depressing. Um, and um, that particularly goes for this week when we're talking about the federal budget, where I think we can pretty much all of us agree that the federal budget did very little to emphasise the needs of um, either young women or older women. Um, but we've got, um, so there's a lot of work to do, and that is one of the reasons why I'm often seen as being very depressing. But some of these issues around respect um, and harassment are also a bit distressing for people. And I know it's so widespread that people have experienced sexual harassment that I don't, um, I, don't I just wanted to warn you about that before we start. Okay, so I now have the Zoom controls completely over the top of all of my data, Shay, which is suboptimal. Um, let's just see if I can remember it. Okay, so this was a question that we asked the young women and the young men, um, what matters a lot, what matters for you in your future of work? And this graph here represents um, people who said that this is the thing that matters a lot to me. So it's not, um, so that's matters, that's the highest category that they could offer. They could also say um, somewhat. Um, so the red line that you've got here is young women, so 16 to 40, and then the grey line is men. Um, and I should say before I completely get into this is if you're um, interested in seeing some, some of the reports and the papers that we've written out of the project, you can see that website there at the bottom, the AWWF. Um, if you just click a little photo of that, you can go and have a look at, um, so you remember it, you can go and have a look at our papers online there and everyone's very welcome to jump in there and if anyone has any questions, send us an email. There's a link on the website. Um, okay, so we asked them what matters a lot, what matters to you in your future of work, and you can see that there's two sticking right out in front there. Um, there's respect, um, with over 82% saying it matters a lot uh, of, of young women, and in terms of security, very close second, um, so they're wanting um, security of employment. Now, interestingly, those two are also the top two for men. Um, and we think that's kind of interesting because the, res the, the respect question actually was one that we threw in right at the end. And I said, let's just, let's put this one in. And it turned out to be our top one. So that allowed me to say to our research team, I told you so. Um, but also it meant that we, because it's, it's one of those amorphous kind of concepts, we don't really know what it means. So we, so we did a bit of research about that in, with focus groups. And maybe people have got ideas about what respect does mean to young women. Um, okay, so they're the top two. The third one um, that, you know, three quarters said was uh, really important to them in their future of work is to have good pay. Um, and I reckon that's a pretty sensible thing for women to be saying. And often conversations about what women want from work relate to, we often talk about things like flexibility and the ability to combine work and family, which are really important. But I think sometimes we forget these really material things about having a sustainable and a living wage is actually really important to young women. Um, and so we, we need to keep that in mind. Um, interesting work is not far behind that and um, I didn't expect that to be sort of there in amongst all the big industrial issues uh, and they're really um, keen um, to have flexibility in their future careers. So remember these are, um, these, this is the whole group between 16 and 40 and that flexibility issue as you'd probably expect gets to be a higher proportion of matters a lot to people once they hit the 30s because that's often when people have got you know first kids are sort of being born around 31, 32 on average. Um, so you can see on the profile there, it's a bit different between men and women. Maybe we could come back to that later, but um, let's dig in now to what the, um, so that's what women say that they want in their future of work, but what do they get? And also um, what are the gaps um, that they face as a result? Let's see if my slides move. Oh, yay. Okay, so as I said, we did lots of focus groups with uh, women across the country in really different sort of uh, grouping. So we made sure that we had a good sample of women across the, the diversity of, of, of women's um, backgrounds in terms of cultural background and a, um, a range of other um, sort of identity areas and backgrounds. Um, and we did lots of focus groups with women across really different occupational areas, because I think it's important not to totalise about women and to assume that everyone's experience as a woman in the labour market is the same. So you can see um, some examples um, here of some of those groups. So what the three quotes I put in here actually are um, young professional women rather than being that broad, more broadly across the spectrum, but we've got lots of data from women, um, young women working in the service sector, working in highly feminised um, care work, um, in aged care. Um, we've got women working in areas uh, that are male dominated and we've, that's been a real thing that we've tried to do. So the feminised occupations and the male dominant occupations. Um, so we have um, a, um, a range of 
you know, the, the experiences of women across the labour force have also done focus groups with women uh, born in Asia, um, women um, in different um, groups that sort of came out for us as being really important with their answers to some of the surveys. So I think these, these are three quotes that, um, you know, come out from the focus groups that we ran and we've had conversations with about 150 Australian women in those little groups. Um, and I guess the first one I'd point you to is that one from the lawyers. Um, and it was interesting, this one for us. So, so this was an online focus group, but we also had a lot of lawyers smattered across different other focus groups. And that's actually led us to go and do some further research on lawyers. Um, and it made us think, if our lawyers who are very highly educated um, and spend a lot of time at university are saying this kind of thing, um, this was a corporate lawyer who said this one and was someone who appeared in court quite regularly. Um, and this was um, her describing um, what is, you know, what does respect or disrespect look like for you? And she says something that I think a lot of people would probably be quite familiar with. She says, I've been spoken down to, I've been laughed at, interrupted and mansplained to more times than I can count. And I think, um, I think a lot of people probably on this call would say, so have I. Um, so that to us is something about disrespect, but um, we would put that in our research in the way that we, um, we sort of try to classify what that kind of behaviour is, is that it's not necessarily sexual harassment, is it? Um, but it really does fit in with what we try to uh, think of as being gender-based harassment. And that is um, harassment and belittling and demeaning um, and silencing that relates to um, the gender. Of, of the person in question. Now, that doesn't mean to say that um, that's necessarily done on purpose, but what is, what, what is to say is that young women feel that this is something that is very gendered and that happens to them and it comes from men um, managers and men peers. Um, another thing we've been quite sort of um, interested in is the way that women are, are spoken to and the way that they're meant to behave in an appropriate way. And I'll put that in great big inverted commas for you. Um, and there's, um, you know, there's you want one at the one at the bottom here, this young woman is saying, um, so there's a bit of a culture around what's the right way to act as a woman, right? So if you're, um, if you're sort of acting like one of the boys, you know, why are you being aggressive? Um, and, you know, and she's just saying, well, I'm actually just feeling like I'm being friendly. And there's a bit of a trap sometimes for women at work around being um, both, um, what would I say, being both seen as competent and, and professional, but also being seen as being likeable. And that's a, a, that's a really big um, struggle that many women um, report having experience of at work. And it's something that men don't necessarily report in the same way as having the same impact on them about what, what the right thing to do is. Um, so something that a lot of women in politics talk about as well. Um, now this one's a little more on the sexual harassment end of, of the spectrum. And it's a young woman in agriculture who spent a lot of time before she um, talked to us about this, talking about how much she loved her job. Uh, and this is why I include this one. Um, she was talking about how, what a struggle it was for her to get into this um, really boisy profession. Um, the training that she'd done and the, the way that she really loved the ideas and the technical aspects of the work that she was working in, which was very highly skilled work. Um, and then she's talking about the way that the lack of respect at work for her is really undermining her, her ability to actually enjoy her job. Um, and she's sort of saying, look, apart from, once she said, look, it's such a good job and I've just been so excited to be here and move to the country and do this kind of work, she says, it actually makes me phys feel physically sick and I hate going to work most days. Um, and she's actually talking here to us about actually what I'm going to do is just, just get out of here because I just can't put up with it anymore. So that, that's some of the depressing stuff. Um, okay, so in our survey, we actually asked a question directly about sexual harassment, and that was, the question was a little bit different to the one that you might have seen in the Sex Discrimination Commission's um, very good report that they put out earlier this year. And they find slightly higher rates, but it's, the question is over the lifetime or over the last five years in their questions. Our question was, are you currently experiencing sexual harassment at work? And so the 12% the there, that's all of the women that we spoke to in that um, survey said that they were currently being sexually harassed at work. And if you think about the fact that the sample there is about two and a half thousand workers, um, that's a lot of women who are being um, not very comfortable and probably frightened about going to work tomorrow. Um, we looked at, break, we're breaking down a key interest that we've got is about women's um, experience in very male dominated and what we call, oops, sorry, another technical failure, that's my lights. Um, very male dominated and, um, and what we call hyper masculine occupations. And hyper masculine occupations 
are occupations where women, um, or put it the other way, where men are 85% plus of the occupational um, population. And we do that looking at um, ABS census data um, from 2016, the last census. And so that tells us that of those women who are working those very male dominated occupations and professions, 27%, so you know, um, close to a third of them are telling us that they're currently experiencing sexual, sexual harassment in their current job today at work. So when we hear governments, for example, as happened a couple of days ago um, in the budget, um, talking about why we need to actually be getting more women into STEM and more women into these very male dominated areas and more women into the trades, um, I'm a big advocate for that. And I, I think it's a really important thing that we do. But I say um, to those people who make those arguments, you have a look at this data and have a look at the experience that women talk to us about when they're working in those contexts. And rather than starting to think that you're gonna, um, you know, just sort of push women into the pipeline, so to speak, why don't we have a bit of a think about how we can change the culture of those organisations, occupations and those industries before we just go and throw young women into those sort of positions. So it's a really nuanced and a complex kind of picture that's going on because that's pretty, um, that's pretty high. Uh, and you can see some of those identity groups um, and experience groups there that um, culturally and linguistically diverse women were much more likely to say that they were experiencing sexual harassment. Um, LGBTIQ plus women were more likely, uh, again, to say that they were experiencing sexual harassment at the moment. And interestingly, women with disability or disabilities said that they um, were currently experiencing sexual harassment at a higher rate. And that's significant when you look at the 12% compared to 21%. I'd be really interested in people's feedback on that, actually. Um, and, um, and yeah, okay, so I think we'll just come back to that, Shay, at the end, do you think? Okay, good. Um, all right, so security is another issue. So that was the second um, issue that um, women said that they wanted and mattered to them in their future of work. So remember how we have these conversations all the time about, you know, work uh, and um, what women want from work is flexibility. Um, I think we need to read... Uh, what women say about flexibility alongside their need for security. Um, because I don't think that women are telling us that what they want is, um, you know, necessarily just long-term precarious employment, like Shay said that she's experienced. I think what they're telling us is that they want flexibility that works for them, but they also want to have a job they can count on. They want a wage they can count on. Um, so let's look at this. So the gap here is, so that was 81% said that it matters a lot to them to have a secure job in the future. And then uh, on the same scale, so at the furthest end, and when we ask them, what do you currently, how much do you agree that you currently have this? Only one in, um, one in five told us that they currently strongly agree that they have that at work. So um, that need for security is not being met. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, under COVID, of course, we've had some really strong effects um, on some of the industries and occupations and the types of jobs that young women are working in. Um, this here is not gender segregated, the, um, the graph I've got here for you. This is ABS data looking at underutilisation. And underutilisation is unemployment plus underemployment. And underemployment is people who say, I would like to work more hours if it was available to me. Unemployment is I'm looking for a job. So the underemployment rate, that line at the top there, is the is people 15 to 24, um, and that is at an historical high, and a very good proportion of those people who are underemployed, um, and that most likely means that they are in precarious employment as COVID hit. Um, that's young women that we're looking at there. So I would say that um, one thing that we could definitely say is that um, things have not got more secure um, for women during the COVID period, in fact, is quite challenging. And that's another one that I think we'd like to get some questions on, Shay, if people have got experiences of that or questions around some of these things, we could have a chat about that. <clears throat> okay. Um, good pay was one of the key things that came out. Um, I hope you like my, my little um, diagrams I've got here. That took me a very long time to work out how to do that. Um, what we're trying to do here is represent for you some of the challenges that women face in terms of pay, because even though women want good pay and they um, often tell us they don't really know what they should be paid, and I think Shay and I might have a bit of a chat about that later, um, that there are some real challenges there. So my little um, pile of money there, um, it, we know that 14, there is a 14 percentage point gap between what full-time working men and full-time working women earn at the moment. So that's best case scenario. That's apples and apples with, apple, that's apples and apples, right? 
Um, if we look at any other measures like um, earnings gaps or a range of other things, so if we're comparing this, so this is not the amount of money that someone brings in, it's the amount of money that only full-timers earn without any of the bonuses or without any um, loadings or anything on top of it. Um, if we look at earnings gap, it's actually at least double that. Um, and if we look across different sectors and different occupations, it's not a question of uh, whether there's a gender pay gap, it's a question of how big the gender pay gap is because it exists in every sector. Um, in some sectors, it's as high as about 30% among full-time full -time to full-time um, and much higher um, for other forms of work. So that's a big challenge. Like women are getting paid less than men, men are, um, even full-time workers. <clears throat> now, one of the reasons for that um, is the absolute undervaluation of highly feminised uh, women's areas of employment. Uh, I don't want to keep talking about the budget, but I think we've seen come out again um, this week um, in, you know, a great opportunity that we had to actually fund um, childcare um, and other forms of care like aged care um, and even do things like trying to wage, uh, raise the wage rates to professional wages in those sectors. Um, we've missed that opportunity through the federal budget this time. Let's cross our fingers for the next one. Um, but undervaluation is seen by many people, um, including in our team, who look at what, why there are gaps between what women across the labour market earn and men across the labour market earn, is that women are in occupations that are come off the sort of care professions, they're highly feminised and because of that they're very undervalued. Um, in terms of um, another big challenge, uh, a really critical issue, particularly for young women, um, but it's across the board really, um, but, but really acute in some sectors, <clears throat> is wage theft, which is where employees are paid um, significantly less than they should be paid, whether that's just the flat hourly rate or whether that's the rates um, that are associated with things such as penalty rates um, and overtime uh, rates of pay for Sundays and, you know, different shift arrangements and whatnot. Um, that's a really big, um, really big issue. Um, and it's something that you'll have noticed has become front page of the paper kind of stuff and actually isn't just your little corner shop that's engaging in these kind of practices. We see it across some of the very, very biggest uh, retailers, for example, or really famous names in uh, restaurant and catering kind of areas as well. Now, all of those challenges in pay lead to a lifelong challenge because if you're earning less across the career and then also you're earning less um, because women are the most likely people in the labour market to take time out to care for kids, that means that when you get to the end of your career, um, that you've got less in retirement savings in that savings period. And one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons we know that women are the majority of people who retire um, with low super balances and into poverty. And we know that women have about half the super balances that men do. When you're, you know, 16, when you're 20, um, superannuation, thinking about what, uh, what your balances look like um, and what they're going to look like when you're 60 or 65 probably seems a very long way away. But I think it's a really big challenge and something we need to think about pretty early in the career and also particularly making sure that employers are actually paying into our superannuation because that's, that's a legal requirement that employers need to do that. Okay. Flexibility. Um, that's um, something that is very important um, to women and more, much more important as they get older. So six in ten women say that flexibility matters a lot um, to them um, in a future job. Um, but when you ask them how many, how many of them strongly agree that they currently um, have the flexibility they need in their job, we only um, have two in 10 who are saying that they strongly agree. Um, and then the gap for women over 30, as I mentioned before, is even greater. So two, two thirds are essentially saying it matters a lot to them, but only 15% are saying that they have the flexibility they need. So they get, it becomes more important to them, but the gap is bigger. So, um, what we do know about flexibility though, particularly for young women, um, and we've seen this particularly um, brought out in the period of COVID and the COVID recession, is that women really predominate in those precarious flexible jobs. So I think what women are saying to us, as I said before, is not that they don't want uh, flexibility. I think a lot of women do want flexibility, but they don't necessarily want the jobs that they have flexibility in at the moment, which is in, in um, precarious jobs where they don't have a lot of control over the hours they're working week to week and therefore they don't have a lot of control over what their care arrangements might be or what their pay is on a week to week basis. Okay, um, so that's what all the data says um, and what, you know, the surveys that we've done with, um, you know, workers across the economy say to us about what they value, what they need and what they're interested in. Um, but I think 
Shane and I'm now just going to go over to the Ray and Shay show again and have a bit of a chat about um, what that what we think that all might mean and then we're going to skip over to having a chat with you about what your reactions to it are. Yeah, I feel like there is a <coughs> lot to unpack and mm. I feel like every section could probably have its own one hour segment and that exactly. probably wouldn't... No, Shay, like... <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to circle back to the topic of respect because I feel like that's a topic that really resonates with everyone who's tuning in tonight and with everyone in the research. And so I, I have a question about um, what is it about the way that women are socialized that makes them more susceptible to this kind of disrespect? Because I feel like we sort of need to start at the base level to get an mm. understanding of why this happens. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you could flip it the other way and say, what is it about the way that men are socialised that they think it's okay to sort of treat women um, in particular ways? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question, isn't it? Because I think it goes, it goes way back to the ways in which um, young men, boys, might have a sense of entitlement and superiority over women, potentially, um, and that women, potentially, young girls, might be socialised to feel um, that what, they need to appropriately do as um, to be appropriately behaving um, for their own gender is to be um, sort of more obedient and quiet and not bossy and not those kind of things. So I think there's a, there's a lot going on there that goes you know goes back to families and goes back to gender norms that pervade absolutely everything in society from school to families to all of our relationships. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? What do you reckon? I think I think it's a big question, so I'm sorry to just handle that one over to you. Um, I think women do internalise a lot, and I think in particular, um, maybe a sense of like victim blaming. We get disrespected so often, we almost come to expect disrespect. Mm. And so I think everyone maybe will have like a line where they try to figure out how far is too far. Mm. Is a sexist joke too far? Is someone touching you in a way you don't want to be touched too far? And mm -hmm. often when people come from a background of trauma, that line yeah. is like not very clear. And so it can be really hard to put up boundaries. And this mm. is leading to another important question is, um, you know, why aren't women reporting sexual harassment in the workplace or what happens when they do report? Yeah, yeah that's why it's a really good question. Um, and I look, the data um, from that national uh, inquiry that Kate Jenkins and the Sex Discrimination Commission did suggest that it's something like, I can't remember the, the data, but it's less than one in five um, women who are sexually harassed do anything about it at all. Like most people just don't even tell anyone, you know, not even their a workmate or a friend. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. And we've done in some of our focus group work, um, talk to women about that because there's almost not a woman that you talk to who hasn't had some experience of sexual harassment. Now, whether they've been the victim of it or whether they've known that it's gone on in their workplace or whether one of their mates has talked to them about it, everyone knows what it is and what it's like and how revolting it is and how horrible it makes you feel. Um, but I think one of the reasons why people... I think there's two sort of sets of answers. One is that it's really embarrassing, okay, and it can be really shaming for the person who's the victim and it's just sort of like so... makes you feel so personally icky that it's something that you don't quite know how to approach. And I think that's what, I think that's something on workplaces that they really need to be trying to find the way that to give people language around it and try to try to give people who are watching this kind of thing happening, not just the people who are the victims, some kind of language and some process to be able to deal with it. I think the other reason why people don't complain is I think often um, they don't trust the process. They don't trust that it'll be dealt with confidentially. They don't trust that it'll be done in a way that'll be quick. And they don't trust that they won't be punish themselves so there's a lot of onus there on a lot of people who aren't the victim to be doing something to make people feel a little bit more like they they should they can be confident if they take action yeah i think that's really reflective of what we see at the working women's center every day when clients approach us and we hear all kinds of stories about um things that happen once people do report so they'll lose shifts they'll get demoted, they'll be told that the, the perpetrator in question had a hard talking to, but no actual real consequences. And so I think this is, um, you know, really quite telling that often a lot of workplaces can be boys clubs, 
the managers, other men and the women, other people in the customer service roles. Mm. Um, and I, so I think it comes to this question of what can we do about it? And I like to think about this on both a structural and a personal level, because I yeah. feel like it's a lot to take on in terms of feeling like it's your responsibility to have to take on a perpetrator. So yeah. um, if you want to speak to the structural recommendations of how we handle sexual harassment in like a broader way, well, we need it to stop being a personal relationship thing and we need to stop expecting victims to fix it. Um, we need um, workplaces to be actively take, asking questions and having processes in place to, to deal with it. We need to be not just showing victims that their, um, their complaints are going to be taken seriously, but we've also got to show that to other people who might think about um, this behaviour being okay. Um, we need to have um, a range of changes. I think one of the things in that report that Kate Jenkins put out that I was quite attracted to was the idea of moving to um, a positive duty um, on workplaces to provide a safe, um, harassment-free workplace. Um, we did that in the work health and safety area about 15 years ago, and that led to some quite significant changes around safety practices where um, executives, um, managers, um, board directors can actually lose their house or go to jail if they're not um, providing a, a safe workplace. So I think that's a, that's got some, that would have some legs and some teeth there for um, trying to do something kind of structural. But I think it's really about trying to find ways to move away from making this an issue of the person who's complaining or who's the victim, because you feel so powerless in those situations, you don't really feel able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And just sort of thinking about it, on the personal level, the things that I would recommend is that even if you just talk to someone, mm. because I think often we have a burden of feeling like it's our job to keep these secrets yeah. when it's not, yeah. you know, these are your stories, you own them. So talk to someone, even if it's your mum, I think. Right. Yeah. Mum or your mate or your sister. Yeah. Just being heard and believed. And then maybe you seek help from a professional. This can be your doctor, a psychologist, your union, uh, your local working women's centre, um, you know, the Fair Work Commission, the Fair Work Ombudsman. There's a lot of options. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And we're going to be putting up some of those resources that people can access for those kind of things. But I, I totally agree. Working women's centres are a jewel in this country in terms of the advice they give to women. Um, but I'd also say ring your union. And there is now a centralised number that you can ring to get advice. Most unions have got women's officers and people who are trained to deal with things like this. So use the expertise that's there. Yeah. So I just wanted to jump to um, another theme, um, thinking about uh, job security. And I think the, the funny but not funny thing about this is so often these issues really compact upon each other, like security, flexibility, good pay, respect, they all go hand in hand. So it's quite hard to separate in some ways. Mm. Um, but I'm particularly interested in um, precarious work and the casualization of work. Um, what are some of the common problems that are associated with the casualization of work? How is this affecting women and their lives? Mm. Well, the majority of casual workers are women. Um, and the majority, you know, really fast growing um, group in the labour force is actually older casual women who are working longer and longer. You know, the problem with casual work is, you know, it's, you know, we talk about flexibility, but it's flexibility often in, in casual work, which is not mutually beneficial. And it, it allows um, businesses to flex up and flex down, but doesn't actually allow um, employees to be able to have that security of income. Or sometimes, or the opposite, sometimes you actually have people on the great oxymoron, which is um, permanent casual work, you know, where they spend many, many years just doing the same shifts over and over again, working the same hours. So, you know, it's really associated with um, a lack of control over the over income that has an impact, as you say, it's so connected up with the other things. Um, and it's, um, you know, I guess it's people who are working in casual contracts are often don't see themselves as real workers, if you like. They're not in their professional job, which um, is often not the case anyway, because casual work is pervading into all kinds of sectors, uh, including my own in higher education. Um, and um, often people can be career casual workers. So um, it has an impact at work, but it also has an impact in terms of what people can do outside of work. So it's hard to get a loan if you're working casually. It's hard to save money. Um, you know, it's a tricky, I think it's one of the most challenging um, sort of pernicious problems that we've got in the labour market, actually. 
Yeah, absolutely. It makes it hard to get a rental. It's very hard to prove that you've got a, an income coming in. Yeah. Um, I think with particularly sometimes the way that casual workers get treated is almost like they're on call or yeah. like when they need to take time off, it's not treated like a valid reason. So yeah. I, a personal story of mine is that um, I once had to call in uh, to cancel a casual shift because I had a funeral and they kept asking me if I could work around it or just rearrange it somehow. And I was like, I don't really understand how you rearrange a funeral. Mm. So they're yeah. not shy to put pressure on you or to make you feel guilty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, think, that's what I mean about not being mutually beneficial, right? So, yeah, I think, yeah, so it's a, it's a challenge. And I think often people feel a bit expendable and sometimes they are in casual jobs. Um, and so uh, coming back to the question of, well, what do we do about it? Um, I think um, one of the um, more recent legislation changes that have come up was that there was support for casual employees to be converted to permanent staff, but yeah. it's not necessarily for all industries or all jobs. So if you work systematically for the same hours every week for 12 months, you can ask for them to make you permanent but that doesn't mean that you're going to be permanent. Mm, yeah, that's right. Um, but that would be a great right, wouldn't it, if someone actually is working on a long-term basis in the same hours over time for the same employer. It seems to make sense that they should be able to have the permanency of employment. Um, so, yeah, lots of moves like that in different sectors and industries, and I think there's going to be lots and lots of cases about, about that. But I don't know, what will we say to individuals? If you want a permanent job, I guess you try and ask. Like try and ask for one, try to try to make it known that that's something that you really want. But um, unfortunately, your control is not necessarily in your hands, is it? Yeah, and I think maybe try, don't be afraid to exert your boundaries when needed. Like, yeah, if you're not available, you're not available. And that's yeah. tricky to do sometimes, but if you're not available, you're not available. <laughs> you're not being paid for it and you're not on call. Uh, let's talk about... Pay, we? we were going to talk about yeah. pay, weren't we? And then do you think we should go to questions or... Yeah, I think money and then questions. Yeah. So what? So pay, I think, you know, that's a big um, sort of challenge. But what do you say to people if they are worried about not being paid the right amount of money? And, um, you know, what should ha what are the warning signs if, they, if they're worried about it? What should they do if they think that they, they're not getting paid the right amount of money? Yeah, I think one of um, the red flags is that if your pay slip doesn't say what award rate you're on, or if no one wants to discuss pay and everyone's kind of afraid about that, um, or maybe if you're not getting a pay slip at all. Um, and I think if you, um, one, um, try to ask if you're on an award rate or an um, EBA. Um, and these are all kind of complicated terms that can sound a bit like gobbledygook to um, you know, people who aren't familiar with it. Award rates are basically a guide to say, um, per industry what you should be getting paid and what kind of job description whereas an enterprise agreement is basically a private agreement that your workplace might have to decide what your work conditions will be like. So I'd also recommend um, logging your hours. You can do this through an app called um, Work With Me, I think from the Fair Work um, Commission. Um, but Ombudsman you can also, or Commission? Ombudsman, I think. Mm. I kind of get them uh, mixed up interchangeable, the C and the O. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, just keep really good records and then get in touch um, with someone to ask because I think with being underpaid, it can feel like not a big deal because like, maybe it's just like an hour that you're not getting paid for or maybe it's just like a couple days. But then if you think about, you know, so um, I had a festival bar work job where we were all getting underpaid. We didn't get um, penalty rates or paid for the nights or weekends or working overnight and so that's happening to all of us if we're all getting paid at least five dollars less than what we should an hour and there's a hundred of us yeah that's a lot of money yeah so it all counts hmm. and it's a lot of money that you don't have in compound interest in your superannuation and if someone if a business is not paying you the right rate of pay for your hour the hour that you're working it's unlikely they're paying you your right loadings and I would be very surprised if you, your superannuation is being paid or your workers' comp premiums are being paid, and that's pretty dangerous. Exactly. And I think young women should be thinking about their superannuation 
because it might seem really far away, but it can really affect you later on in life. Um, do you have anything to say about how super can affect um, women or why they should think about it? Oh, well, super is such a big issue, isn't it? And, um, you know, that's why, as I said before, women have a lot less super than men do um, because they get paid less um, and it compounds. So, um, you know, this is one of the reasons I'm quite worried about all of these young people taking, um, I can understand why they are, but young people clearing their super balances at the moment to try to get through COVID because they're so uh, worried and financially um, in trouble at the moment. Um, I saw an estimate the other day that suggested that pulling 10 grand out of your super now, if people have got that, I know a lot of young people don't, um, can, can be about $150,000 when you're retiring. So that, that's the magic of super is it compounds. So the money that's not going in is money that you're not getting when you're retiring. Um, you know, it's, it, it can be your rent or your holiday or whatever when you're older. Yeah. And I think um, on a structural level, we should be thinking more about making harsher legislation to, you know, punish employers for wage theft. Um, because at the moment, it's just too easy. So if I went and stole um, money out of the till, I could get fired on the spot. But if I get ripped off at work, I have to go and file an application and go through all this hoops and confusing stuff yeah. just to get what's owed. So Yeah, it's, it's annoying. But, you know, you work in women's centres and the unions um, will do that for you for free. It's worth it, do it. <laughs> yeah. um, so I thought it might be a good time to get into the questions because mm. I think they're starting to pop off. Yeah. Uh, it's great to see that you're all um, so chatty and that this is you know, resonating uh, with you all. So one of the uh, questions that we have coming in is that, let me just jump here. Uh, if you could have written this week's budget, what are some of the initiatives or policy changes you would have introduced to support women's employment to recover after COVID? Mm, what do you reckon? Uh, I mean, I think um, there should be more support for people who have to reskill. Yeah. Um, I don't think making degrees more expensive is going to be helpful to anyone. And I also don't think that tax cuts mean anything if you've lost your job. And I also don't think that people who are paying, who are earning maybe like 40K of a salary should be paying the same amount of tax as someone who is earning 120K. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, um, and if I was doing it, I probably, like the thing that I think would have made a big difference here is um, funding childcare. Um, childcare is so important for women because it's important because it's a very feminised sector. Um, so it's women's jobs, putting, pumping more resources into childcare gets more jobs for women. Um, but also lots of families make decisions about who's working on the basis of how much childcare costs. And at the moment, childcare, if you're working more than two days a week, it's um, almost economically uh, for most families. Having two parents working, one working full time, one working two more than two days is economically irrational to do. So we've got to do something about fixing that. Um, I think that would have been a good time to think about. Um, I think we need to look at um, tax cuts again. I agree with you on that, Shay. Um, the people who will benefit out of the tax cuts are um, older, uh, wealthy men, um, not um, young women. And I think we need to find ways to be getting people back to work and being humane with people as they're trying to. I think we should raise the rate and I think we need to um, keep job seeker rates up and keep that extended. So um, that's what I would do if I was the treasurer. And also higher education and vocational education and training um, and education are gonna be critical for our recovery from um, this recession. And it's a shame that we're gonna be on the back foot because of the changes that have gone through the Senate today. Yeah, I think um, this question actually flows quite well with the budget question, which is how do we desegregate the workforce as part of reaching equality? And I think that's speaking mm. to the fact that we have a feminized workforce and a hyper masculine one. Yeah. Um, I personally think that it would be good to get um, more, more women into um, masculine uh, workforces, but doing it in a way that's aware of all the issues that women are facing. So mm. going in with a very sense of self-awareness about the sexual harassment issues 
Um, but that could also be through um, the access to education, so apprenticeships in particular. Yep. So having funding for women specifically to go into those trades and with more support. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I'm, look, I'm a big advocate for <laughs> rights and things, <laughs> um, for women moving into uh, non-traditional areas um, for lots of reasons, including the fact that all workers in male-dominated areas get paid more. Um, some of the research that we've done recently in a paper that's not quite published um, says that workers um, in male dominated areas have more voice at work and more respect. Um, but we know there's a lot of gender trouble in uh, male dominated sectors. And so we, as I say, we can't just throw women into those areas and expect that they're going to cop the environment. Also, I think we need to think about having um, men going to work in um, some of the other areas. So men working in care and education and in health, they're the jobs of the future. Um, so clever blokes might want to go and work in those areas and given what we know about how people are valued depending on who they are they might push up wages in the um, in the feminized sectors yeah absolutely and so often we see in highly feminized areas when men are in those sectors they tend to be the managers yeah. um, instead yeah. of the and people. that's why that's why areas like health has one of the highest uh, gender pay gaps actually is a sector and that's about men working in the more professional jobs uh, and men working in the more senior managerial jobs so we've got to try to break down the I, I think the glass you know we talk about the glass ceiling but we've got to break down those glass walls absolutely too um, within um, industries but also um, across industry I agree it's a really important challenge all right, we're going to change gears a little bit, which I think will be refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Anon writes, this might be superficial compared to some of the big topics we're discussing, but what advice do you have to a new graduate who's unsure about business attire norms? I don't normally wear high heels and makeup and I don't want to wear it in my job, but I feel like there's a societal expectation in the workplace for women to do this. Mm, what a good question. Um, I think you've got to make your own way. And I think things are changing a little bit around that. Um, you know, women are now allowed to wear pants to work. And when my mother's generation, you know, it was frowned upon, women who wore pants were strange. Um, you know, things things change. I think gender kind of norms are maybe a little bit less rigid than they used to be. Um, I would probably be the last person in the world, Shay, to give someone fashion advice. <laughs> but I think um, it's a good question. I think, and I'm thinking about the advice I'd give to my daughter, actually, who's the young woman who's closer in your age than she is to mine, Che. Um, you've got to work within the boundaries of what um, looks professional, but you don't need to look like everybody else. You know, um, you don't need to wear a suit. You don't, you know, just being, I think it's about being tidy, but also feeling that you're being yourself. I think that's what, what you've got to do and just have, have the respect for yourself. And it's okay to be a bit quirky too, actually. And in fact, you don't need to wear makeup if you don't want to. Um, I don't think, and I think you need to wear high heels. I don't. <laughs> Life's too short to have sore feet. Absolutely. I... I think it also really depends on the industry you that you're in, because I think there can be different expectations, yeah. um, you know, especially for women to perform femininity. You yeah. know, I think in comparison to spending an hour, you know, getting ready in the morning, I'd rather sleep or do something yeah. else. That's or read the newspaper, actually. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but and, there are some boundaries that you have to sort of mm. work with, right? Yeah. Mm. I don't think there's as much expectation. I could be wrong. And I'm an academic, right? So, you know, nobody would care what I would wear to work. You know, I could wear um, I could wear a fur coat and no one would notice. I could wear whatever I wanted. But um, I think um, I think I think there's less expectation that, you know, the whole um, short skirts, high heels kind of thing going on these days. I think there's a lot more a bit more space to 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 not perform femininity in, in that particular way. So I think make your own way. Um, talk to your mates as well about what you find some people who work in the industry you work in and see what what's okay in the industry what do people generally generally do find people like you who dress kind of the way that you do and take some advice from them yeah absolutely uh another question um i love my job but i dread going to work because of how i've been treated do you have any advice to help me to introduce intersectionality in my workplace and to be recognized as a non-binary person? Mm. I've tried to simply have a conversation, but I get treated like a nuisance and that I just want attention. Mm. Good question. What do you reckon, Shay? I think this is a really um, tricky one. And, you know, as a queer person myself, I understand that um, being out at work can be really difficult. And mm. there was, uh, there's been many jobs where I've not been out and I specifically just didn't want to go through the emotional 
um, I guess, push to like have to go through and educate. And, you know, that's part of the reason why um, I left that job in the end. It's just because it didn't mesh with my values. But, you know, not everyone has that ability to leave jobs that don't necessarily mesh with our values. Mm. So I wouldn't necessarily go um, recommending that um, to everyone, but I'd maybe think about smaller ways that you can try to implement it as a norm. It could be um, as like requesting people to put their pronouns in their email signatures, or if you're doing meetings with um, outsiders in particular, as part of introductions, you try to include pronouns just to try to make it more of like a normal thing. And mm. I think, um, you know, if you have the um, energy, you could look into um, training from uh, a place like Minus 18. They have some really great presenters. Okay. Yeah, do you have any um, thoughts you'd I like to I think I agree about? absolutely with you, Shay. Like, I think, um, I mean, there's one part of me, you know, I'm of a different era, right? One part of me thinks, um, you know, that we need to have some privacy from work and, and work doesn't own everything about us, right? Um, but on the other and, you know, we need respect at work and we need to be valued for who we are. So it's a difficult sort of balancing act. So but look, I'll, I'll just say, I, I think I agree with everything you say. Uh, and so we've got another question that's saying, um, if you work in a place with no HR resources, how yeah. do you make a complaint? Yeah, that's tricky, right? Okay. So um, did, did they say about what? About what type or just a complaint? Uh, they they didn't say about what, but if yeah. you're still there, Anon, please tell us what kind of a complaint, because I feel like it really depends on what the um, the topic is, because it can depend on how much, um, you know, with how serious it is or if there's like other people that you can speak to. We see this a lot with small businesses, because mm. often the person that you're complaining about is also the person you need to complain to, mm. um, which can feel particularly hostile. Um, I think in some uh, ways putting things into writing so at least to try to work out what you don't want and what you'd like to happen just so for yourself to kind of build that confidence um, and I think you know when in doubt go and get advice to see if there's other kinds of follow-up that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I think also you had some good tips before today about the pay issue which is keep records, even if you're not given records, you keep your own records. So make sure you keep in your diary or on your phone, write down how many hours you worked, um, you know, like keep keep the, keep the things up for yourself. There are things that the workplace ombudsman can do around your own logging of things. And what was the name of the app you, you said, Shay? Uh, work With Me. Work With Me. Um, download that app. I'm gonna download that this afternoon and have a look at it. Um, those kind of, keeping your own records um, is really important, but there, there are pretty good online resources now around knowing what, the, what, what you're entitled to and knowing what your rights are, whether that's through um, fair work or whether that's through the unions or whether that's through the working women's centres. You can usually Google an award, which is your base rate of pay, or if you're working for a big employer, you might be covered by an enterprise agreement, an EBA. And you can usually just Google the name of your employer and you'll find the enterprise agreement, which will have a schedule in the back, which should have your hourly rates of pay or your, um, you know, um, more permanent rates of pay. So knowing, getting your information and just working out what you're getting and what you should be getting is, is a first step. Because if you go and try to make a complaint, you need to have that information ready anyway. And, that, and, and if you've got the information there, someone who's going to help you, it's going to be easier for them to help you. And I think it can do so much for your confidence as well, just knowing that you're in the right. Um, so definitely always try to find um, find out information before acting. Yeah, um, and also if someone's doing that to you, that's that's unlawful. Um, so um, collect your information. It's often really tricky to leave jobs if you need to rely on the income, but get, just be on the lookout for another job because someone's treating you like that. You don't want to be working there. Walk. Uh, so I've got one more question coming in saying, as a young woman, I didn't really grow up learning about unions. Can you explain a bit about what they do? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so unions essentially are organisations that look after workers, mostly in a particular industry. Um, and so like the retail industry or the hospitality industry or in my industry in education. Um, and what they do is they are the ones who basically um, assist with making the awards and working out what the base rate of pay is. 
if you're in a big workplace or sometimes in smaller ones that they'll be involved in enterprise bargaining so lifting your rate of pay above the award they give advice about all kinds of workplace matters so pretty much you could ring the union about anything about safety about harassment about issues about what your rate of pay should be um, there's just so many things that they do across working life um, you know um, you know, redund redundancies and it's basically about giving advice about a whole bunch of things in some sectors they do lots of education as well it probably doesn't surprise you that in my um, union we do a lot of um, we do the seminars I spoke at one the other day about what COVID means for women um, but in my union um, they do things like protest about things that they think are unfair around uh, rates of pay for young people or um, make submissions to inquiries around um, things like sexual harassment and how we need to change some of the laws so it's a really broad based thing that's both about very technical stuff about the rights and responsibilities at work, but it's also a broader sort of movement um, about people's rights and, and what we need to do to make things better and make the world a better place, really. Absolutely. I think that's a, um, a good note to end on. Um, join your union. <laughs> we, um, we do have a slide that has a, um, a bunch of resources that can help you find um, information. So if this session has brought up you know, any issues for you where you've started to, you know, question something that's happened at work and you'd like to follow it up, I highly recommend um, following it up with um, a union. So if you are a member, talk to them. If not, consider joining. Um, there's also all these other services that are similar to the ones um, that I work at that can provide information and advice. Um, and they're often um, free and they're always confidential. So um, definitely, follow it up and act sooner rather than later um, because often a lot of these things have a specific time limit to it. Mm. So on uh, that note, I think we'll wrap things up. Ray, thank you so much for joining me uh, today. It's been um, really fun talking about something that I care a lot about. It's been fun for me too, Shay. It's been lovely to work with you on putting this together. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone else for tuning in. Um, if you have any additional questions that you'd um, like to ask from YWCA Australia, you can email them at giving um, at ywca.org.au. Thanks for your time and have a good day. Make sure to tune in for the rest of the, the sessions tomorrow. It's our last day.